Shazadpur, June 1891 From the bank to which the boat is tied, a kind of scent rises out of the grasses, and the heat of the ground given off in gasps actually touches my body. I feel that the warm, living earth is breathing upon me, and that she also must feel my breath. The young shoots of rice are waving in the breeze, and the ducks are in turn thrusting their heads beneath the water and preening their feathers. There is no sound save the faint, mournful creaking of the gangway against the boat as she imperceptibly swings to and fro in the current. Not far off there is a ferry. A motley crowd has assembled under the banyan tree awaiting the boat's return, and as soon as it arrives they eagerly scramble in. I enjoy watching this for hours together. It is market day in the village on the other bank, that is why the ferry is so busy. Some carry bundles of hay, some baskets, some sacks, some are going to the market, others coming from it. Thus, in the silent noonday, the stream of human activity slowly flows across the river between two villages. I sat wondering, why is there always this deep shade of melancholy over the fields, arid river banks, the sky and the sunshine of our country? And I came to the conclusion that it is because with us, nature is obviously the more important thing. The sky is free, the fields limitless, and the sun merges them into one blazing whole. In the midst of this, man seems so trivial. He comes and goes like the ferry boat from this shore to the other. The babbling hum of his talk, the fitful echo of his song, is heard. The slight movement of his pursuit of his own petty desires is seen in the world's marketplaces. But how feeble, how temporary, how tragically meaningless it all seems amidst the immense aloofness of the universe. The contrast between the beautiful, broad, unalloyed piece of nature, calm, passive, silent, unfathomable, and our own everyday worries paltry, sorrow-laden, strife-tormented, puts me beside myself as I keep staring at the hazy, distant blue lines of trees which fringe the fields across the river. Where nature is ever hidden in chorus, under mist and cloud, snow and darkness, there man feels himself master. He regards his desires, his works as permanent. He wants to perpetuate them. He looks towards posterity. He raises monuments. He writes biographies. He even goes the length of erecting tombstones over the dead. So busy is he that he has no time to consider how many monuments crumble, how often names are forgotten. Shazidpur, June 1891 There was a great big mast lying on the river bank and some little village urchins with never a scrap of clothing decided, after a long consultation, that if it could be rolled along to the accompaniment of a sufficient amount of vociferous clamour, it would be a new and altogether satisfactory kind of game. The decision was no sooner come to than acted upon with the Shabash brothers, all together, heave ho, and at every turn it rolled, there was uproarious laughter. The demeanor of one girl in the party was very different. She was playing with the boys for want of other companions, but she clearly viewed with disfavor these loud and strenuous games. At last, she stepped up to the mast and without a word, deliberately sat on it. So rare a game to come to so abrupt a stop. Some of the players seemed to resign themselves to giving it up as a bad job, and retiring a little way off, they sulkily glared at the girl in her impassive gravity. One made as if he would push her off, but even this did not disturb the careless ease of her pose. The eldest lad came up to her and pointed to other equally suitable places for taking a rest, at which she energetically shook her head and, putting her hands in her lap, steadied herself down still more firmly on her seat. Then at last they had recourse to physical argument and were completely successful. Once again, joyful shouts rent the skies and the mast rolled along so gloriously that even the girl had to cast aside her pride and her dignified exclusiveness and make a pretense of joining in the unmeaning excitement. But one could see all the time that she was sure boys never know how to play properly and are always so childish. If only she had the regulation yellow earthen doll handy with its big black top knot, would she ever have deigned to join in the silly game with these foolish boys? All of a sudden, the idea of another splendid pastime occurred to the boys. 
two of them got hold of a third by the arms and legs and began to swing him this must have been great fun for they all waxed enthusiastic over it but it was more than the girl could stand so she disdainfully left the playground and marched off home then there was an accident the boy who was being swung was let fall he left his companions in a pet and went and lay down on the grass with his arms crossed under his head desiring to convey thereby that never again would he have anything to do with this bad hard world but would forever lie alone by himself with his arms under his head and count the stars and watch the play of the clouds the eldest boy unable to bear the idea of such untimely world renunciation ran up to the disconsolate one and taking his head on his own knees repentantly coaxed him come my little brother do get up little brother have he hurt you little brother and before long i found them playing like two pups at catching and snatching away each other's hands two minutes had hardly passed before the little fellow was swinging again shazadpur june eighteen ninety one i had a most extraordinary dream last night the whole of calcutta seemed enveloped in some awful mystery the houses being only dimly visible through a dense dark mist within the veil of which there were strange doings I was going along Park Street in a hackney carriage, and as I passed St. Xavier's College, I found it had started growing rapidly and was fast getting impossibly high within its enveloping haze. Then it was borne in on me that a band of magicians had come to Calcutta, who, if they were paid for it, could bring about many such wonders. When I arrived at our Jurasanko house, I found these magicians had turned up there too, they were ugly-looking of a mongolian type with scanty mustaches and a few long hairs sticking out of their chins they could make men grow some of the girls wanted to be made taller and the magician sprinkled some powder over their heads and they promptly shot up to everyone i met i kept repeating this is most extraordinary just like a dream and someone proposed that our house should be made to grow the magicians agreed and a preliminary began to take down some portions the dismantling over they demanded money or else they would not go on the cashier strongly objected how could payment be made before the work was completed at this the magicians got wild and twisted up the building most fearsomely so that men and brickwork got mixed up together bodies inside walls and only head and shoulders showing it had altogether the look of a thoroughly devilish business as i told my eldest brother you see said i the kind of thing it is we had better call upon God to help us, but try as I might to anathematize them in the name of God, my heart felt like breaking and no words would come. Then I awoke. A curious dream, was it not? Calcutta in the hands of Satan and growing diabolically within the darkness of an unholy mist. Shazadpur, June 1891 The schoolmasters of this place paid me a visit yesterday. They stayed on and on while for the life of me I could not find a word to say. I managed a question or so every few minutes to which they offered the briefest replies and then I sat vacantly, twirling my pen and scratching my head. At last I ventured on a question about the crops but being schoolmasters they knew nothing whatever about crops. About their pupils I had already asked them everything I could think of so I had to start over again. How many boys had they in the school? One said eighty, another said a hundred and seventy-five. I hoped that this might lead to an argument, but no, they made up their difference. Why, after an hour and a half, they should have thought of taking leave, I cannot tell. They might have done so with as good a reason an hour earlier, or for the matter of that, twelve hours later. Their decision was clearly arrived at empirically, entirely without method. Shazadpur july eighteen ninety one there is another boat at this landing place and on the shore in front of it a crowd of village women some are evidently embarking on a journey and the others seeing them off infants whales and grey hairs are all mixed up in the gathering one girl in particular attracts my attention she must be about eleven or twelve but buxom and sturdy she might pass for fourteen or fifteen she had a winsome face very dark but very pretty her hair is cut short like a boy's, which well becomes her simple, frank and alert expression. She has a child in her arms, and is staring at me with unabashed curiosity, and certainly no lack of straightforwardness or intelligence in her glance. 
Her half boyish, half girlish manner is singularly attractive, a novel blend of masculine nonchalance and feminine charm. I had no idea there were such types among our village women in Bengal. None of this family apparently is troubled with too much bashfulness. One of them has unfastened her hair in the sun and is combing it out with her fingers while conversing about their domestic affairs at the top of her voice with another on board. I gather she has no other children except a girl, a foolish creature who knows neither how to behave or talk, nor even the difference between kin and stranger. I also learned that Gopal's son-in-law has turned out a never-do-well and that his daughter refuses to go to her husband. When at length it was time to start, they escorted my short-haired damsel with plump shapely arms, her gold bangles and her guileless radiant face into the boat. I could divine that she was returning from her father's to her husband's home. They all stood there following the boat with their gaze as it cast off, one or two wiping their eyes with the loose end of their saris. A little girl with her hair tightly tied into a mistake, tightly tied into a knot, clung to the neck of an older woman and silently wept on her shoulder. Perhaps she was losing a darling Didi money. Footnote 1 An elder sister is often called Sister Jewel, Didi money. End of footnote 1 who joined in her doll games and also slapped her when she was naughty. The quiet floating away of a boat on the stream seems to add to the pathos of a separation. It is so like death, the departing one lost to sight, those left behind returning to their daily life, wiping their eyes. True, the pang lasts but a while, and is perhaps already wearing off both in those who have gone and those who remain, pain being temporary, oblivion permanent. But nonetheless, it is not the forgetting, but the pain which is true, and every now and then, in separation or in death, we realize how terribly true. Shelida, October 1891 Boat after boat touches at the landing place, and after a whole year, exiles are returning home from distant fields of work for puja vacation, their boxes, baskets and bundles loaded with presents. I notice one who, as his boat nears the shore, changes into a freshly folded and crinkled muslin dhoti, dons over his cotton tunic a china silk coat, carefully adjusts around his neck a neatly twisted scarf, and walks off towards the village, umbrella held aloft. Rustling waves pass over the rice fields. Mango and coconut treetops rise into the sky, and beyond them there are fluffy clouds on the horizon. The fringes of the palm leaves wave in the breeze. The reeds on the sandbank are on the point of flowering. It is an altogether exhilarating scene. The feelings of the man who has just arrived home, the eager expectancy of his folk awaiting him, this autumn sky, this world, the gentle morning breeze, the universal responsive tremor in tree and shrub and in the wavelets on the river, conspire to overwhelm this lonely youth gazing from his window with unutterable joys and sorrows. Glimpses of the world received from wayside windows bring new desires, or rather, make old desires take on new forms. The day before yesterday, as I was sitting at the window of the boat, a little fisher dinghy floated past. The boatman singing a song, not a very tuneful song, but it reminded me of a night years ago when I was a child. We were going along the Padma in a boat. I awoke one night at about two o'clock, and on raising the window and putting out my head, I saw the waters without a ripple, gleaming in the moonlight, and the youth in a little dinghy paddling along all by himself and singing. Oh, so sweetly, such sweet melody I had never heard before. A sudden longing came upon me to go back to the day of that song, to be allowed to make another essay at life, this time not to leave it thus empty and unsatisfied, but with a poet's song on my lips to float about the world on the crest of a rising tide, to sing it to men and subdue their hearts, to see for myself what the world holds and bear, to let men know me, to get to know them, to burst forth through the world and life and youth like the eager rushing breezes, and then return home to a fulfilled and fruitful old age to spend it as a poet should. Not a very lofty ideal, is it? To benefit the world would have been much higher, no doubt, but being on the whole what I am, that ambition does not even occur to me. 
I cannot make up my mind to sacrifice this precious gift of life in a self-wrought famine, and disappoint the world and the hearts of men by fasts and meditations and constant arguments. I count it enough to live and die as a man, loving and trusting the world, unable to look on it either as a delusion of the Creator or a snare of the devil. It is not for me to strive to be wafted away into the airiness of an angel. Shelida, 2nd Karthik, October, 1891 When I came to the country, I ceased to view man as separate from the rest. As a river runs through many a climb, so does a stream of men babble on, winding through woods and villages and towns. It is not a true contrast that men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. Humanity with all its confluent streams, big and small, flows on and on, just as does the river from its source in birth to its sea of death, two dark mysteries at either end, and between them various play and work and chatter unceasing. Over there, the cultivators sing in the fields, here the fishing boats float by. The day wears on and the heat of the sun increases. Some bathers are still in the river, others are finished and are taking home their filled water vessels. Thus, past both banks of the river, hundreds of years have hummed their way while the refrain rises in a mournful chorus. I go on forever! Amid the noonday silence, some youthful cowherd is heard calling at the top of his voice for his companion. Some boat splashes its way homewards. The ripples lap against the empty jar which some village woman rests on the water before dipping it, and with these mingle several other less definite sounds, the twittering of birds, the humming of bees, the plaintive creaking of the houseboat as it gently swings to and fro, the whole making a tender lullaby as of a mother trying to quiet a suffering child fret not she sings as she soothingly pats his fevered forehead worry not weep no more let be your strugglings and grabbings and fightings forget a while sleep a while shelida third karthik october 1891 it was the kojagar full moon and i was slowly pacing the riverside conversing with myself it could hardly be called a conversation, as I was doing all the talking and my imaginary companion all the listening. The poor fellow had no chance of speaking up for himself, for was not mine the power to compel him helplessly to answer like a fool? But what a night it was! How often have I tried to write of such, but never got it done! There was not a line of ripple on the river, and from a wave over there, where the farthest shore of the distant main stream is seen, beyond the other edge of the midway belt of sand, Right up to this shore glimmers a broad band of moonlight. Not a human being, not a boat in sight, not a tree nor blade of grass on the fresh-formed island sandbank. It seemed as though a desolate moon was rising upon a devastated earth, a random river wandering through a lifeless solitude, a long-drawn fairy tale coming to a close over a deserted world. All the kings and princesses, their ministers and friends in their golden castles, vanished, leaving the seven seas and thirteen rivers and the unending moor over which the adventurous princes fared forth, vanly gleaming in the pale moonlight. I was pacing up and down like the last pulse beats of this dying world. Everyone else seemed to be on the opposite shore, the shore of life, where the British government and the nineteenth century hold sway, and tea and cigarettes. Shelida 9th January 1892 For some days the weather here has been wavering between winter and spring. In the morning, perhaps, shivers will run over both land and water at the touch of the north wind, while the evening will thrill with the south breeze coming through the moonlight. There is no doubt that spring is well on its way. After a long interval, the papilla once more calls out from the groves on the opposite bank. The hearts of men too are stirred, and after evening falls, sounds of singing are heard in the village, showing that they are no longer in such a hurry to close doors and windows and cover themselves up snugly for the night. Tonight the moon is at its full, and its large round face peers at me through the open window on my left, as if trying to make out whether I have anything to say against it in my letter. It suspects, maybe, that we mortals concern ourselves more with its stains than its beams. A bird is plaintively crying tee tee on the sandbank. The river seems not to move. There are no boats. 
The motionless groves on the bank cast an unquivering shadow on the waters. The haze over the sky makes the moon look like a sleepy eye kept open. Henceforward the evenings will grow darker and darker, and when tomorrow I come over from the office, this moon, the favorite companion of my exile, will already have drifted a little farther from me, doubting whether she had been wise to lay her heart so completely bare last evening, and so covering it up again, little by little. Nature becomes really and truly intimate in strange and lonely places. I have been actually worrying myself for days at the thought that after the moon is past, her full, I shall daily miss the moonlight more and more, feeling further and further exiled when the beauty and peace which awaits my return to the riverside will no longer be there, and I shall have to come back through the darkness. Anyhow, I put it on record that today is the full moon, the first full moon of this year's springtime. In years to come, I may perchance be reminded of this night, with the tee tee of the bird on the bank, the glimmer of the distant light on the boat off the other shore, the shining expanse of river, the blur of shade thrown by the dark fringe of trees along its edge, and the white sky gleaming overhead in unconcerned aloofness. Shalida, 7th April 1892 The river is getting low, and the water in this arm of it is hardly more than waist-deep anywhere so it is not at all extraordinary that the boat should be anchored in midstream. On the bank, to my right, the riots are ploughing and cows are now and then brought down to the water's edge for a drink. To the left, there are the mango and coconut trees of the old Shalida garden above, and on the bathing slope below there are village women washing clothes, filling water jars, bathing, laughing and gossiping in their provincial dialect. The younger girls never seem to get through their sporting in the water. It is a delight to hear their careless, merry laughter. The men gravely take the regulation number of dips and go away, but girls are on much more intimate terms with the water. Both alike babble and chatter and ripple and sparkle in the same simple and natural manner. Both may languish and fade away under a scorching glare, yet both can take a blow without hopelessly breaking under it. The hard world, which, but for them, would be barren, cannot fathom the mystery of the soft embrace of their arms. Tennyson has it that woman to man is as water to wine. I feel today it should be as water is to land. Woman is more at home with the water, laving in it, playing with it, holding her gatherings beside it, and while, for her, other burdens are not seemly, the carrying of water from the spring, the well, the bank of river or pool has ever been held to become her. Bolpur, 2nd May 1892 There are many paradoxes in the world, and one of them is this, that wherever the landscape is immense, the sky unlimited, clouds intimately dense, feelings unfathomable, that is to say where infinitude is manifest, its fit companion is one solitary person, a multitude there seems so petty, so distracting. An individual and the infinite or unequal terms, worthy to gaze on one another, each from his own throne. But where many men are, how small both humanity and infinitude become, how much they have to knock off each other in order to fit in together. Each soul wants so much room to expand that in a crowd it needs must wait for gaps through which to thrust a little craning piece of a head from time to time. So the only result of our endeavor to assemble is that we become unable to fill our joined hands, our outstretched arms, with this endless, fathomless expanse. Bolpur, 8th Jaista, May 1892 Women who try to be witty but only succeed in being pert are insufferable, and as for attempts to be comic, they are disgraceful in women whether they succeed or fail. The comic is ungainly and exaggerated, and so is in some sort related to the sublime. The elephant is comic, the camel and the giraffe are comic, all overgrowth is comic. It is rather keenness that is akin to beauty as the thorn to the flower. So sarcasm is not unbecoming in women, though coming from her it hurts. But ridicule with savours of bulkiness women had better leave to our sublime sex. The masculine Falstaff makes our sides split, but a feminine Falstaff would only rack our nerve. 
Bolpur, 12 Jaista, May 1892. I usually pace the roof terrace alone of an evening. Yesterday afternoon, I felt it my duty to show my visitors the beauties of the local scenery, so I strolled out with them, taking Agor as a guide. On the verge of the horizon, where the distant fringe of trees was blue, a thin line of dark blue cloud had risen over them and was looking particularly beautiful. I tried to be poetical and said it was like blue collyrium, on the fringe of lashes enhancing a beautiful blue eye. Of my companions, one did not hear the remark, another did not understand, while the third dismissed it with the reply, Yes, very pretty. I did not feel encouraged to attempt a second poetical flight. After walking about a mile, we came to a dam, and along the pool of water there was a row of tal, fan palm trees, under which was a natural spring. While we stood there looking at this, we found that the line of cloud which we had seen in the north was making for us, swollen and grown darker, flashes of lightning gleaming the while. We unanimously came to the conclusion that, that viewing the beauties of nature could be better done from within the shelter of the house, but no sooner had we turned homewards than a storm, making giant strides over the open moorland, was on us with an angry roar. I had no idea. While I was admiring the collyrium on the eyelashes of beauteous dame nature, that she would fly at us like an irate housewife, threatening so tremendous a slap. It became so dark with dust that we could not see beyond a few paces. The fury of the storm increased, and flying stony particles of the rubbly soils stung our bodies like shot, as the wind took us by the scruff of the neck and thrust us along to the whipping of drops of rain which had begun to fall run run but the ground was not level being deeply scarred with water courses and not easy to cross at any time much less in a storm i managed to get entangled in a thorny shrub and was nearly th thrown on my face by the force of the wind as i stopped to free myself when we had almost reached the house a host of servants came hurrying towards us shouting and gesticulating and fell upon us like another storm some took us by the arms, some bewailed our plight, some were eager to show the way, others hung on our backs as if fearing that the storm might carry us off altogether. We evaded their attentions with some difficulty and managed at length to get into the house, panting, with wet clothes, dusty bodies and tumbled hair. One thing I had learned, and will never again write in novel or story, the lie that the hero with the picture of his lady love in his mind can pass unruffled through wind and rain. No one could keep any face in mind, however lovely, in such a storm, he has enough to do to keep the sand out of his eyes. The Vaishnava poets have sung ravishly of Radha going to her tryst with Krishna through a stormy night. Did they ever pause to consider, I wonder, in what condition she must have reached him? The kind of tangle her hair got into is easily imaginable, and also the state of the rest of her toilet. When she arrived in her bower with the dust on her body soaked by the rain into a coating of mud, she must have been a sight. But when we read the Vaishnava poems, these thoughts do not occur. We only see on the canvas of our mind the picture of a beautiful woman passing under the shelter of the flowering kadambas in the darkness of the stormy shravan. Footnote 1. July to August, the rainy season. End of footnote. Night. Towards the bank of the Jamna, forgetful of wind or rain, as in a dream, drawn by her surpassing love. She has tied up her anklets lest they should tinkle. She is clad in dark blue raiment lest she be discovered, but she holds no umbrella lest she gets wet, carries no lantern lest she fall. Alas, for useful things, how necessary in practical life, how neglected in poetry, but poetry strives in vain to free us from their bondage, they will be with us always. So much so, we are told, that with the march of civilization, it is poetry that will become extinct, but patent after patent will continue to be taken out for the improvement of shoes and umbrellas. Bolpur, 16th Jaista, May 1892. No church tower clock chimes here, and there being no other human habitation nearby, complete silence falls with the evening as soon as the birds have ceased their song. There is not much difference between early night and midnight. A sleepless night in Calcutta flows like a huge, slow river of darkness. One can count the varied sounds of its passing, lying on one's back in bed. But here the night is like a vast, still lake, placidly reposing, 
with no sign of movement and as i tossed from side to side last night i felt enveloped within a dense stagnation this morning i left my bed a little later than usual and coming downstairs to my room leant back on a bolster one leg resting over the other knee there with the slate on my chest i began to write a poem to the accompaniment of the morning breeze and the singing birds i was getting along splendidly a smile playing over my lips my eyes half closed my head swaying to the rhythm the thing i hummed gradually taking shape when the post arrived there was a letter the last number of the sadhana magazine one of the monist and some proof sheets i read the letter raised my eyes over the uncut pages of the sadhana and then again fell to nodding and humming through my poem i did not do another thing till i had finished it i wonder why the writings of pages of prose does not give one anything like the joy of completing a single poem once emotions take on such perfection of form in a poem they can as it were be taken up by the fingers but prose is like a sackful of loose material heavy and unwieldy incapable of being lifted as you please if i could finish writing one poem a day my life would pass in a kind of joy but though i have been busy tending poetry for many a year it has not been tamed yet and is not the kind of winged steel to allow me to bridle it whenever i like the joy of art is in the freedom to take a distant flight as fancy will then even after return within the prison world an echo lingers in the ear an exaltation in the mind